now to visit one of the greatest historians of all time and find the iconic Lost Ark. They did. We're smart, and my. He told me enough. No, I. Hey everyone, it's Don J. Corleone here, and I'm here with a brand new movie review. And this movie review is going to be for a, an adventure film that is was directed and produced by two legendary filmmakers teaming up together to make this franchise happen. And of course, it was released in 1981, and we have a Fifth movie coming out soon this month. But that does not need to worry right now. Because this review is going to be for none other than the iconic 1981 masterpiece and Spielberg's best movie ever, Raiders of the Lost Ark. The first film of the Indiana Jones franchise and directed by the legend himself, Steven Spielberg. And produced by George Lucas. So, what's the plot of this movie? The year is 1936. An archaeology professor named Indiana Jones is venturing in the jungles of South America searching for a gold statue. But unfortunately, he sets off a deadly trap and miraculously escapes. And unfortunately, the idol gets taken from him by his rival, Balak. Then, Jones hears from a museum curator named Marcus Brody about a biblical artifact called the Ark of the Covenant, which can hold the key to human existence. And Jones has to venture to vast places such as Nepal and Egypt to find this artifact. However, he will have to fight his enemy, Rene Balak, and a band who's now reached a band of Nazis in order to reach it. So, how is this made? Well, George Lucas conceived Raiders in 1973, shortly after finishing the comedy film American Graffiti. An old movie poster of a heroic character leaping from a horse to a truck reminded Lucas of the early 20th century serial films as he enjoyed as a youth, like Buck Rogers, Zorro's Fighting Legion, Spy Smasher, and Don Winslow of the Navy. He wanted to make a B-movie modeled on those serials and conceived the adventures of Indiana Smith, featuring an adventurous archaeologist named after his Alaskan Malamute dog. Around the same time, Lucas was trying to adopt the space opera serial Flash Gordon, but could not obtain the rights. And he shelved the Indiana Smith project to focus on creating his own space opera, which was, of course, the Star Wars original trilogy. Then in 1975, Lucas discussed his serial film idea with his friend Philip Kaufman. The pair worked on a story for two weeks, and Lucas imagined his character as a college professor, professor and archaeologist adventurer. Based on his own appreciation for archaeology and famous archaeologists like Ram Van III, Roy Chapman Andrews, and Leonard Woolley. And Kaufman removed Lucas's vision of Smith as a nightclub patron and a womanizer, and suggested the Ark of the Covenant as the film's central goal. And he learned of the Ark from his childhood dentist. The Ark provided a source of conflict for the hero and the Nazis, playing off Nazi leader Adolf Hitler's historical fascination with the occult. And of course, Lucas wanted a, Lucas wanted Kaufman to direct the film, but because he was already committed to working on the Western, the outlaw Josie Wales, Lucas paused the idea again and resumed working on Star Wars. Then, in May 1997, mean May 1977. Lucas vacationed in Hawaii to avoid any potential negative news about the theatrical debut of Star Wars, and he invited another legendary filmmaker, Steven Spielberg, to join him and his wife. On a beach near Mauna Kea, Lucas and Spielberg discuss their next projects. Spielberg wanted to direct a James Bond film, but Lucas pitched the, the Adventures of Indiana Smith, and Lucas still hoped Coffin would direct it, but a few months later, it was clear he could not participate, and Lucas asked Steven Spielberg to replace him. In pre-release, pull polling showed little... Now, when the film was shot and marketed... And then officially released around June 1981, 
pre-release polling, polling showed little audience interest in the film, especially compared to another movie that, like Superman 2. Despite this, though, eventually Raiders of the Lost Ark would surprisingly become the highest grossing film in 1981, and originally earned $330 million worldwide, and played in some theaters for over an entire year. And it was a critical success with critics receiving praise for its modern take on the serial genre, its non-stop action and adventure, and the performances of the cast, particularly of Ford, Allen, and Freeman. And the film was nominated for seven, several awards and won five Academy Awards, seven Saturn Awards, and one BAFTA, among other assolates. And Raiders of the Lost Ark is now considered to be one of the greatest films ever made and has made a lasting impact on popular culture, spawning a host of imitators across several media and inspiring other filmmakers. The United States Library of Congress selected it for preservation in the National Film Registry in 1999, and Raiders of the Lost Ark is the first entry of what became the Indiana Jones franchise, which in course included four follow-ups. Temple of Doom in 1984, which created the PG-13 rating, and Last Crusade in 1989, which was, of course, a sequel, while well, Temple Doom was a prequel, but you'll find out why I don't like to call Temple a prequel. And of course, in 2008, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull and the Diarrhea of Disney in this month, upcoming month, which is going to be literally very soon. Fuck. And of course, it also had a television series, video games. All right, guys, let's let's see my hat a little more. Clearly, video games, comic books, novels, theme park attractions, toys, and an amateur remake. Sorry, guys. I just wanted you guys to see my hat a little more clearly in this review. Now, as for my reaction, well, this, without a doubt, is easily Steven Spielberg's greatest movie he has ever done in his life. This movie deserves all the praise it still gets to this very day, and is most definitely Harrison Ford's best role yet. Nowadays, we some people keep forgetting how beautiful blockbusters can be. Sometimes too much CGI makes everything possible, and therefore very often al also al arbitrary. In Raiders, you can actually seem to feel the physical pain some of the actors and stuntmen had to go through to provide two hours of pure entertainment. And of course, the story isn't waterproof. The Nazi weren't that present in Egypt in 1936, and how did Indy survive the ride on the submarine again? But lots of good and variable action scenes are accompanied by a story that develops fast and excitingly and is always close to being implausible, but luckily never is. Spielberg, Lucas, and most of all Harrison Ford created a hero that is nowadays iconic in the film industry. You even see this so-called hero in the channel art, in a little in the little channel arts on my profile. And then of course you see him, you see a clip of the boulder in the intro. With their attempt to make a homage to adventure comics of the 1930s, they created their own legend. It's a hot sunny day in South America. You see a bunch of men, shot mostly from the back, and they're walking deep in the forest. And you see a tall, dark figure. He's wearing an old leather jacket. The five o'clock shadow looking like it's closer to midnight. He wears a fedora like this one. And he carries a bullwhip. Yes, an actual bullwhip. And finally, two of the men enter the cave. After one tries to betray him, one gets scared away by bats. And we hear about some guy named Forstall, who is good, very, very good, but he never came out of the place alive. But they answer anyway, and they're confronted with tarantulas, the spears that are triggered by blocking out the lights, and a pit that they must swing over, and then more tiny poisonous darts that come out of the wall. And all of this to protect an ancient gold statue. They manage to recover it, but one guy who is played in a cameo by Alfred Molina, guys, in one of his first roles, betrays the, betrays the fedora guy, and dies on his way out. And the other barely makes it out of the room before it all falls on him. And then and else gets crushed by a boulder. Because he has to get out of the cave and a giant boulder chases him in one of the most iconic shots ever. Finally, he makes it out of the cave, but unfortunately he's surrounded by the natives and his enemy named Balak, who takes the gold statue that this guy works so hard for. And then the guy, but the guy escapes and makes it to the plane where he's in the pasture. And there's a big snake in a big snake in a plane, and we find out the guy hates snakes. What's the man's name? His name is none other than Indiana Henry Jones Jr. Woo! You are just left speechless watching that opening scene of the movie. Has there been really that better beginning of a movie ever? Absolutely not. 
Does the beginning have anything to do with the rest of the film? Well, no. It's all decoration for what the movie is going to put you through in this all well, the rest of the 90 minutes that are going to come. Raiders took this simple idea and maybe an idea that the guys had from watching Saturday afternoon movies and made it larger than life. And it never stops you to take your breath. It's filled with rich characters from Indy himself to Marianne to Belloc and even to Marcus Brody. Each has their own personality that shines through in certain scenes. And some of my faves were easily where the first scene he meets Marianne, who's having that shot contest in her bar in Nepal. Then there's... Then there is her scene with Balak and they get drunk together and she tries to leave using only a butter knife. And of course you can't forget Indy's battle with the swordsman and his unrivaled determination to get the Ark. Indy, there is no time. Like, if you still want the truck, or Indy, there is no time. If you still want the truck, it's being loaded onto a truck for Cairo. Which is literally talking to Indy after he was in a fight with a shirtless Nazi. And of course he's like, truck? What truck? And then later, get some transport back to England. Boat, plane, anything. Meet me and Omar's. I'm going after that truck. Which is a perfect iconic scene where he goes to chase after the truck to get the Ark. And he successfully manages to do so. And the set pieces are fantastic. And although some of the Wilder and Se Wilder end sequences are slightly dated now, it hasn't lost the excitement factor at all. And it's a perfectly crafted movie as well. Movie from location to location without any distraction or spuffless scenes. It just feels like it's all there for a reason and that it belongs there. And Harrison Ford's Indiana Jones, Harrison Ford is perfect and excellent in the role. And I'm inclined to think that he was more indie than he was, well, Solo, but that's not, I think even he agrees with that, apparently because he doesn't like the character Solo and prefers playing Indiana Jones. He has many more facial movements and voice inclinations in his early movie than he probably does nowadays. And back then, like, he was dynamic, adventurous, strong, and wisecracking as the best of them, and easily. Right here. And there's one thing, guys. Only Harrison Ford plays Indiana Jones. Only he does. Nobody else. He can only he can be Indiana Jones. That's one thing that needs to be th through and said. Then there are some excellent movie-making moments in this, with George Lucas and Steven Spielberg showing talent galore and just oozing out of every pore like we're and then they end up making an excellent, entertaining movie. And some, some could even argue that there could be a bit more depth or seriousness to the story, but come on. It's a ripping adventure yarn. You don't need depth. Saving the Ark from the Nazis, surely that's plenty enough. And who can't forget the scene where Indiana Jones faces bandits in the marketplace in Egypt, fighting sores with his wife, with his wits and fists, only to be finally challenged by a dark, robbed, robed adversary, brandishing a heavy disembarked, Decembering night type of suburb as he swings the impressive blade about his head menacingly. Indiana looks his opponent up and down briefly and draws his pistol casually and shoots the villain dead as if his patience had been tested a moment longer than he could tolerate. And the amount of time and effort put into the comedy adventure death of each character dazzles me because you can't really tell if it was filmed the same year like many other years like Fame was or and it really has a unique look to it, and the key lighting in the piece is amazing. It's almost everything looks like it was perfectly worked out, and every scene of this is fun and enjoyable. A rollicking chase between two rival archaeologists as they travel all over the world. The film even uses world maps so that we can keep track of the action whenever the characters are traveling anywhere in search of the mystical Ark of the Covenant. You throw in some Nazis, snake phobia, cutting edge for the time special effects, a damsel in distress that isn't too much of a damsel in distress and actually does some useful stuff. And this, and of course, it got the Saturday matinee feel. That, and you have an adventure film like no other to that point in time. And for the time, the special effects in this movie were breathtaking. You're bringing the settings alive, nearly making us believe that the Nazis' faces are actually melting at the film's end. And some of the blue screen shots leave a little to be desired. And it was still fairly early in the evolution of that filmmaking technology. And so these are easily forgivable. And the set pieces are expertly realized, and the fight scenes are well choreographed. And the action scenes are even varied, and that really means a lot. You don't get the same kind of jolt of adventure. You get like fist fights, battles with snakes, with airplane propellers, guns, knives, poison darts, fire, supernatural plague type winds, chases through city streets, and caves, mountains, you name it. It's all in there. And another great epic scene is where Indy faces that tough Nazi in front of a plane propeller and that whole fight just completely ends when the propeller shreds the Nazi to pieces brutally. 
This was back when Lucasfilm had the balls to be to make some gruesome deaths. These first three Indiana Jones films were one that Lucasfilm wasn't afraid to be gruesome. Same goes for Revenge of the Sith. Right here. There was like there was like no stupid little wacky antics, no stupid little dizzy humor in here. Everything was actually played seriously. Only the comedic stuff was played comedically. And the action scenes didn't have a stupid joke thrown in them every single time. Like nowadays. So yeah, if only that could have still happened in today's era. But when it comes to other characters besides Indiana Jones, Marion Ravenwood is the best heroine of the series. If there's a possible... If there's a possible choice against the next two, it's her absence, though. In the next two films, it's sadly her absence. I mean... Then again, I guess Temple's supposed to be a prequel. Like, there's, like they call it, even though it doesn't really feel like one. Like, unlike the other two love interests of the series, Marion is, like, tough and aware of the events... And it's, perf and it's still perfectly ladylike. And it might see somewhat of a contradiction, but to anyone who's seen it, this whole franchise, I feel like Marion's the only best love interest of this whole series, and I'm glad they bar and I'm glad they at least barred back and forth. Because the other two love interests, Elsa Scheider and Willie Scott, of the other two movies, they don't match up. I mean, Elsa just kind of betrays Indy. And then just goes back to loving him again. Willie Scott, we all know, is really annoying. And never shuts up. And you'll find out about Willie in the next Indiana Jones review. So yeah, none of those two match up to Marion. Like, Marion actually was the best of them all. Marion wasn't just a love interest. Marion wasn't really just a damsel distress. She was actually, like, an actually well-done character. That you could root for. And actually a good female lead. And you also have Indy's other sidekick, Sala. Who's easily among, the, among Indy's best sidekicks alongside Short Round from Temple of Doom. And, and, and of course Jones Sir, Indy's dad from The Last Crusade. Who was played by Sean Collery. Right here. And also... And I did love that Saul even came back in Last Crusade, and I do like he's... I think one of the only good qualities of Doll of Destiny is at least Saul is coming back in that one, too. That's kind of about it. And then you have the villain, Belloc, who is Indy's rival, and he's actually a pretty decent villain, who's played good very perfectly by Paul Freeman. But, to be honest, guys, my honestly personal favorite, number one favorite villain of the franchise... Maul Ram. I feel like Maul Ram is still the best villain of this franchise. And of course, I even enjoy how this movie ends. This movie could not end more perfectly. Like, once like the arc gets restolen, arc gets restolen by the Nazis again, Mary gets captured. Jones ambushes and falls and ambushes the Nazi group on the island and threatens to destroy the Ark, but unfortunately he surrenders after Belloc deduces that Jones would never destroy something so historically significant, and also sur and also surmising that, surprising that Jones wants to know if the Ark's power is real. So the Nazis restrain Jones and Marion at the testing site at Belloc's ceremony as Belloc ceremonially opens the Ark, but he only finds nothing but sand inside. And of course, this other Nazi that the official taught literally just laughs at the whole discovery, thinking that the whole thing inside was pointless. But at Jones's instruction, he and Marion are literally have to close their eyes to avoid looking at the open arc, because we find out that it's not just sand in the arc. Nope. Unfortunately, Belloc can make the dumbest mistake of his life opening the arc, because what's inside the arc, it releases spirits, flames, and bolts of energy, as we know who created the Ark, is furious that it's opened. So all that stuff gets released to pretty much kill Balak Tot and the, every other assembled Nazis before sealing itself shut. And Jones and Marion open their eyes to find the area clear of the bodies and their bindings removed. 
And then, of course, Jones and Marion get back to Washington, D.C. The United States government rewards Jones for securing the Ark, but despite Jones's insistence, the agents state only that the, only that the Ark has been moved to an undisclosed location for top men to study. Which is for the best, because, well, after seeing what the Ark did to Balak, it's better nobody finds it. And it stays hidden for the rest of its life. And it never gets seen again. Only for top men to study and only for government officials to know about. And in a large warehouse, the Ark is pretty much crafted up and stored among countless other crates. And of course, but it's not too unhappy because Jones and Marion go out for a drink afterwards. So there's still some decent enough ending to it. And plus, I feel like this moment kind of kicks off Indy's other character developments in the other sequels where instead of like giving the rock to giving the rock to his historic to his like officials and superiors, he gives it back to the village because he knows that the superiors are just gonna lock it away and they're gonna put it in a museum and it'll be forgotten eventually. And of course, Last Crusade, he realizes the grail is not the treasure he's meant to find. But his real, the real treasure he was supposed to find was reuniting with his dad. So in a way, the arc having to be moved to an undisclosed location would kick off Indiana Jones' other character development in the next two movies. They even revisit that arc moment in the 4 film, where it's in a crate that gets bumped into and revealed at the beginning of 4. It's a kind of a perfect, so it's a perfect way to keep the arc safe from others, and, and now more won't ever find it, and it will never be opened again. So I'm glad they actually kept it secret, because... The Ark should never be found or opened. Now, does the movie have nitpicks? Well, um... No. I can't think of any nitpicks. I have none. Because this is just one of those movies that is rarely flawless in every way. And this will always be Steven Spielberg's best movie. There's plenty of other great movies he's done, but Raiders of the Lost Ark is still his top achievement in film cinema ever. In the end, so yeah, Raiders of the Lost Ark is flawless. So in the end, Raiders of the Lost Ark is a timeless classic that is definitely worth watching and buying if you love adventure films and Spielberg's work and want to see him and even George Lucas team up together for the first time to make this grand masterpiece. Anyways, that's it for my view of Raiders of the Lost Ark. Wondering how I'm gonna rank Raiders of the Lost Ark. Here's how I'm gonna rank this movie. So overall, if you love Spielberg and adventure films, then I highly recommend watching and buying this movie for your collection for sure, without a doubt, because it is always timeless. And if you're wondering how I'm gonna rank Raiders of the Lost Ark, I'm going to give Raiders of the Lost Ark an obviously good fucking 10 out of 10. There we go. That's it for my review of Raiders of the Lost Ark, and that covers the first review of the Indiana Jones review series. So, this review series for Indiana Jones is going to be easy because I only have three other films to go, so it won't be quite as much of a hassle to get this one done. And so will Shrek series because, well, there's no other Shrek movie coming out, so... So these two review series will be easy to do. But, yeah... You'll be sure to stay tuned for reviews for the other three movies that are coming. And, um, yeah. But until then, guys, that will be it for this. So this week, next, well, don't know when this will, next review will happen. The Temple Doom review will happen because, well, you guys likely saw AJ Markle made a new If I Directed Disney Star Wars video. So I plan to film a reaction to that. And of course, May's ending tomorrow, so tomorrow we're going to be pretty much doing the DVD and Blu-ray Hall live stream again. Can't believe it's that time of month again already. That was fast. And of course, we have Across the Spider-Verse coming out this week, so might be a while before Temple of Doom gets reviewed and Shark 2 get reviewed. But until then, guys, that'll be it for this review. Thank you all for watching. If you like this, want to see more? Don't forget to like, subscribe to Donji Corleone.